Yeah, hi everyone. Thank you very much for being here, listening to us. I'm very looking forward to uh, the day. Um, and yes, as I was introduced, I, I named the, the talk, what is the purpose of games or why we make games? And probably since this is an, an art school, eventually um, uh, we probably agree that games are a culture and I use games in a cultural context. Um, uh, but of course, even that is not very clear what it would be. Um, so I might exp explore this a little bit more uh, because you will see throughout the examples that I will show you today, some of the games are maybe a bit more mainstream, some are a bit more experimental. And uh, I still insist that all of the games I'm going to show are culture and what I find interesting about like even the more, let's say, mainstream for a mass market uh, designed games um, is that we have to think about the audiences as well and who it reaches. And I personally don't believe much in the art that lives only in a white cube, but we actually have to think about the target audiences as artists too, not just as, um, well, business people. Uh, so yeah, I guess it's a lot about the, the intertwining of business and art um, in this talk today. So let's get started with this picture. I, uh, my origin is um, in art as well. So I studied illustration and animation and then discovered games as a medium by accident, really. Uh, this is the first game I made. It was part of a collaboration in my art school and it was drawn on with pencil on paper. Yeah, you'll see all the individual faces here. Quite handmade, the looks of it. I mean, I think it's more than 10 years old now. And uh, you must know, I come from a household where games were always seen as a bit stupid or would make you stupid. My parents pretty much would let me play with wooden toys all the time. So I didn't really have an approach to it for a long time. And university was the first time where I did uh, get in touch with games and this little game made it to San Francisco to the Independent Games Festival where we won a student prize and it showed me all the different things that games could be. So people would make games about political topics, about societal topics, and I realized that games isn't just shooting or stupid waste of time, but you can actually use it as a cultural medium. After that, I worked a bit more as an independent game designer. So this is another title that I'm quickly going to show you the trailer of. It's called Perfect Woman. Rated M for Mature. This is Mary. Mary has it all. She's pretty. She's athletic. She's got two happy children and a loving husband who's also interesting. Mary has an ambitious career but also found her inner peace. She's cultural and she has really good friends. Mary is never stressed out about anything. She's always happy. Long story short, Mary is perfect. And because we know that you want to be perfect too, let us present to you the Perfect Woman Life Simulator. Given your physical condition is excellent and you have supreme coordination abilities, you too can be the perfect woman. Using the Perfect Woman Simulator is easy. Position yourself in front of the Kinect so it can track and analyze your movements. Match the required poses as well as you can. In the decision phase, it's your call. At age 60, you can choose between the minister, the fundraiser, an angry woman, and the senior call girl. You want to be the foreign minister, of course, but that's going to be extremely difficult. You might even think of going for an easier option. Call girl doesn't sound so bad after all. Well, what an attitude. We're here to be perfect, and you can do it. Yahoo! So choose the minister and accept the challenge. You will manage if only you try hard enough. 
Perfect Woman Life Simulator uses a scientifically accurate algorithm to compute life difficulty. In the end, you will learn why some moments in your perfect life have been more difficult than others. While some people pledge for more openness towards diversity and different lifestyles, for you, only the best is ever good enough. And you know now that with the right amount of eagerness and ambition, that you too can be the perfect woman. Um, yes, so that was... Uh, should I stay here? No. Sorry. Um, so Perfect Woman was a fun project and it was artistic and it was experimental and you can actually play it in the ZKM, the Center for Culture and Media Arts in Karlsruhe up until now, but it didn't really sell very well. So it wasn't hitting the mainstream uh, that people wanted in games, probably like one part of it is also that you need to connect and it's not really like a mass medium that people are uh, into a lot or were into a lot uh, at the time. So I decided, okay, let's uh, work with some companies and this is one of them, uh, where I like the games. Um, us two games, for example, made uh, Monument Valley, which was my favorite game at the time. Some of you might know it. It's a Escher-inspired puzzle game for mobile. Um, I think it was created in 2014, so quite dated already. Um, but, well, <laughs> I'm pretty old. So uh, 10 years ago, I thought, okay, it would be really cool to work on something like that, where at the same time, I knew okay, they make really artistic and really high quality work that I can stand behind, but also they reach millions of players. So I took on a job as senior designer on Monument Valley 2, which was really like a real honor for me um, because it was my favorite fr game franchise and I could work on the sequel. Um, and we developed a, a dynamic with, between a mother and a daughter, and I didn't have a daughter back then yet. Uh, where, where the kid follows the mother around and the puzzles evolve around it. Um, I also worked on the next game after the Monument Valley franchise as lead designer, which is Assemble with Care. And I'm gonna play the trailer for you as well, just so, yeah, maybe notice a bit the difference in the appeal and maybe mainstreamness uh, compared to the previous trailer. You ever wonder why we get so attached to things? When you think about it, all this stuff we own is just screws and wires. Except sometimes it isn't. A whole life can be captured in the flash of a camera. Wounds healed by picking up a phone. Even the smallest object can hold the biggest meaning. But when it all falls apart, how do we put things together again? So this one was an opening title for Apple Arcade. I think they just removed it from the service, but you can still play it on uh, Steam. And yeah, as you see, this one was much more polished, much, led, uh, much less edgy, if you want, so it wasn't radical. It was still, it still had a nice message. It was still about, yeah, feelings or, or had this message that you maybe shouldn't give up relationships but rather try to fix it, but it wasn't um, anywhere as experimental as Perfect Woman that you'd seen before. And I got lucky and was awarded a BAFTA, as a BAFTA um, Breakthrough UK for my work on the title. Next, I moved up um, into a position 
of production managers. So at Nereal, which is another UK-based company, <clears throat> I oversaw the production of several titles. Some of you might still know the Reigns titles. It's again a mobile game uh, where you swipe left and right. And they did a sequel to it. I also released Animal Farm, a narrative game about George Orwell's, um, <clears throat> well, Animal Farm uh, novel and Card Shark. But throughout my time at, through, sorry, uh, throughout my time at Astu Games and at Nereal, although both of the companies I would say were quite forward-thinking and um, yeah, maybe progressive if you want so. Uh, it was still a weird dynamic because especially in the, uh, in the leadership team, it was very male dominated. And while I didn't like uh, experience any active discrimination, it was very apparent that any especially creative decision that you might label maybe as more female or more soft, you had to argue extra hard for it. So for example, the last trailer you saw, Assemble with Care, is a very chill and actually very easy experience that focuses on the narrative as is more meditative and the challenges aren't really hard. Um, it was actually quite hard to get that through the board. Um, uh, but the ratings were superb, so players really liked it in the end. And all of that, uh, combined with a few experiences that Francisca had, my co-founder, we decided to create fine games. So my co-founder is the woman in the, on the right, in the beige shirt, and uh, we are our small team. And you have noticed that it says cute games for cute people here. For a long time it had games for women by women but we are kind of rethinking uh, that tagline. We're still very proud of being a female-led team and also make games with obviously our individual perspective, but we don't want to exclude people. And we actually had a lot of feedback from men who said, look, I actually also want to play your game. I'm interested in it. So it felt almost a bit exclusive to label it, labeling it games for women by women. Um, this is maybe a bit nicer picture of the team, <laughs> so we're all remote. Uh, and Piotr, for example, is in Poland, a lot of the team is in Berlin, and myself, I live in Frankfurt, and Kate is in Australia. And uh, yeah, but we still manage to do fun things like Secret Santa for Christmas, where people give each other recipes that they cook at home, and then it's kind of a competition. <coughs> so it works well for us. Um, from the very start, uh, we didn't just have that one game. So I think many indie studios work like this. They have a cool game, maybe they have some traction, maybe they have a community or a good prototype, and then they want to build that game and make a company out of it. For Francisca and myself, it was different. We wanted to build a company and find our audience and then build games for them. Uh, it's all part of this why we make games. So I said in the beginning that games is a cultural product, but not just the game is a pro cultural product, but also the way in which you create it, right? So very early on, we created this document, which is working at Fine, um, like a company Bible almost, you could say, and we revisit it uh, regularly, so some of the things that are in here are being revisited already. Uh, but I wanted to show you a few things where you hopefully get an, get an idea of how we work. Um, so we speak about our vision, about our games, our work, uh, the way we work, uh, the way people progress through their career, and also diversity. Our vision is Fine is a female-led game studio developing games for women. And it is divided into games, culture, and business. Fine is mission-driven, and we believe that a strong culture will result in happy employees, outstanding games, and a successful business. Here is a bit about our games, but I'm not going to go through this, but I want to talk about a few things about work. So, yeah. Um, having happy employees is, of course, one a 
a cultural decision. We want a healthy working culture. We want our people to be happy, but it's also an economic decision because I've seen in other companies that when people get stuck in their careers, myself included, uh, they are not as motivated anymore. You have a lot of turnover, finding a new position or finding someone for an empty position can be very costly and very time intensive. So we thought it would be a good idea to do everything we can so that people stay with us, with us for a long time. Um, one of the things we offer is a 32 uh, hours week and we spread that over five days. The thinking behind it is that people, well, in home office, uh, it's a bit hard anyhow to be eight hours in front of your computer. So usually you do breaks and it's just a bit of a more honest way to say <laughs> uh, what everybody is doing anyways, um, we think. And on top of it, we have parents or we have people who care for their parents or do some political acti uh, uh, are political activists who yeah, would then have uh, time to spend their free time for other things than work. And the other thing where I want to quickly go into, these are three principles that work in our team. Um, I think some of them are quite radical. I try to suggest them in other companies, but it's dif difficult if you have a running system and then change something fundamentally. We want to close the gender pay gap, and one measure that we, uh, that we use to do that is to pay discipline agnostic. So an artist earns the same amount, depending on their experience, of course, um, as a developer. And uh, I've seen in my own experience, I was a designer, I was leading a project and a programmer next to me earned 20 grand more than I did a year. That felt not representative of what people give to the project. And uh, yeah, as I said, it's hard to change in a system or a market that already exists, but it was relatively easy for us to implement it in a new company. We have automatic career progression, so people, we expect everybody to give their best in our company. If somebody doesn't, then we will have, yeah, like disciplinary uh, me measurements as well. Um, but apart from that, uh, when people, yeah, collaborate and everything is, we are happy, then people progress automatically and we don't have performance-based um, progression. You also can stay in your discipline however long you want and don't need to become a manager. Um, so now I'm gonna show you a trailer of our first title, Finding Hannah. Finding Hannah is a hidden object game where you follow the story of three women searching for happiness. <laughs> Hannah wanted to be an artist, but instead she's doing graphic design for demanding corporate clients. In this light-hearted drama, you'll visit a variety of richly <coughs> illustrated locations and search carefully to find all of the hidden objects in each level. The faster you find them, the more points you earn, letting you progress in the story. By completing levels, you earn items that Hannah needs to get through the day. Need a caffeine fix? Just merge the items to make coffee and unlock new episodes. Our company's mission is to make games with female characters dealing with realistic and relatable problems. Will Hannah sacrifice her own happiness to keep her job or risk everything by following her passion? And it's not just Hannah's story. You'll get to know Hannah's mother and grandmother and see how three different generations of women try to relate to one another as they fight for justice, figure out who they want to be, and fall in love. Get lost in an engrossing story and addictive gameplay in Finding Hannah. So I hope it doesn't autoplay the next video note this time. Um, yeah, so that's our title. It's, you might argue it's the most, uh, uh, the most mainstream title that I've worked on. Uh, but as I said in the beginning, we really want to reach a new audience and kind of step down from this elitist uh, podest, podest uh, uh, of knowing better what players uh, want to play. 
Um, but still, apart from the from the maybe shiny outside and the merge game and the hidden object game, there are some important messages that we try to, or questions rather, that we try to ask throughout the gameplay. And one is telling the story of these three women that in very different times, like one lives during the war, one lives in the uh, is a rebel during the 70s, and one is a kind of a lost millennial woman in Berlin, um, how they try to pursue their life and find happiness. I'm going to show you a bit of the process of how we created this game. So these are very early prototypes. We always knew that we wanted to do something with finding objects. This is another one where you connect dots. But when you're running a studio, it's not just about like what feels good and is cool, but you're actually thinking about budget a lot. And these examples would have been very, very expensive. A simple hidden object mechanic, however, is something that can be replayed over and over again and is a more economic, yeah, just system that can convey the story just as well as the other uh, mechanics. This was another example where you, for example, you could click to open the curtain so that li light uh, shed on some of the objects that you needed to find. And in the end, we landed on this format. So this is a very early sketch of a level that I would make, hand it over to the artist, and uh, this is how the game looks now. And now maybe you remember the very first uh, image that I showed in the beginning. It was this one here uh, that I ma made because my mother, uh, my grandmother told me the story about her tanning herself during World War II on the rooftop of a hospital and the aircraft circling around her on top. And we kind of used this very personal inspiration in the game later on. Uh, you might ask who made these beautiful illustrations, and it is Elena Resco. So this is another thing that I'm a big fan of, including game, uh, people into game development that don't originally come from games. So Elena is an editorial designer, and we thought that her style would fit very well with the uh, hidden object theme that we had. And uh, yeah, she's great to work with, and we continue working with her even on new projects. So that was a real a uh, good example of mixing genres or mixing people from different backgrounds. Um, now, going on to the whole launch procedure of our first title, we were able to raise awareness in mainstream media and were able to open the Gamescom as well, which is a big affair in Germany about computer games. With our mission, of course, we took the opportunity. Oops. We also had a few, I'm not sure if, do I not get this to work? Yeah, we, had, uh, we have a community manager as well who made videos such as this one and um, yeah, it got us some tractions as well. And then of course we got some articles in press like Mobile Gamer, uh, who said, fine, wants to smash stereotypes with relatable games made by women for women. <clears throat> and eventually, we launched and were happy to be game of the day on International Women's Day. So um, our approach of being somewhat open with the message we had of these, uh, yeah, like colorful illustrations um, caught Apple's eyes, and we can't complain about featuring from their side and it also got us some <clears throat> articles in mainstream media, which I think makes me most proud because it is always, like I myself don't come from a, like, a, a hardcore gamer background. I always find it nice when I can send these articles to friends or my mother and she realizes that games are actually a good waste of time. We were nominated for some awards as well. And yeah, I think I have to close the presentation soon for some questions, but um, we were happy enough with finding Hannah uh, that we're now thinking about a sequel. And uh, sorry, it's actually my birthday today and I turned off my uh, 
phone, but not my watch. So I'm getting calls. Um, <laughs> yeah, that we're thinking about a sequel about uh, about Hannah, who uh, who inherits her mother's house and finds out even more family secrets. And uh, yeah, I think I'm. Uh, over time already. Yeah, so. that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> Happy birthday. I didn't know it was your birthday thank today. You. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your presentation. I really appreciate that you also talk about the business side because I think often people don't tend to share that side of their work. So um, thank you so much for sharing that as well. Is there a question in the audience for, for Leah? Yes. <coughs> Thank you. So I have a question about the game Finding Anna because you made it on a, uh, available on a smartphone. And I heard that um, on smartphone games, you have a big audience that is made of female players. So making the game uh, a smartphone game, was it made on purpose? I don't know if, he, if this makes sense. No, thank you very much for the question. And sorry, I don't speak very good French. Um, Yes, exactly. So obviously the platform is a big concern when you're thinking about your business plan and the market is in a very rough shape at the moment. So things are changing a lot, business models are changing a lot. It's actually really hard to produce premium games even as an indie, even when costs are low and make back your money. But we still felt that our audience was on mobile and we tried out uh, different business models. So for example, we released the game as a premium game. Um, right now it is a free to start game. That means that you can download it for free and unlock it later on. And that works best for us at the moment. Um, but we also put it on Steam and it does better than we thought. So uh, I think you're very right that it is actually designed as a mobile game. Um, but, uh, well, the reason why it performs well on Steam, I think, is that more people enter the platform, like enter Steam, more and more people are there and are looking for different types of games as well. There's this huge hype about cozy games, some of you might have heard it, about games um, that you just enter basically in order to spend a nice time and that aren't uh, very challenging, but uh, yeah, more con comforting. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, hi. Hi. Um, so I was extremely starstruck when I heard about you working on <laughs> Monument Valley. I'm a big mm -hmm. fan of the game. Um, so I have a question. So, uh, like, it's basically I uh, mostly have played mainstream games catered towards young men all my life. And um, I uh, have always been conflicted with the idea of how we should uh, like approach uh, like specifically like uh, like you know making like making games that uh, include women in games that are currently working for uh, mainstream games made for young men. Uh, like uh, I would like to hear just your thoughts, if possible, as to how we should uh, like s eventually hope to uh, lead and diversify uh, like the idea of mainstream games and include women along with uh, y the games that are currently working well for young men uh, who play games. Uh, let's just say like Doom, a game that uh, has always worked uh, with an extreme amount of gore and violence, and that's always worked for young men and it does sell well, right? So how do we, uh, if possible, include women into like uh, a, a potential audience for games like these? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. I don't think that every game is for everyone, so I'm not sure if we have to include more women into Doom. I actually don't know what the statistics there are. I know the statistics of computer games worldwide, like even including consoles and PC, you have 48% female players. So it's not that the majority of, or the vast majority of players is men. And on mobile, it's even more percent, like there are more female players than male players. So where I really see the lack is not in the audience, but in the titles and in the teams that produce the titles. So we are still, as an industry, in I think in Germany, it's only 28% of the developers are female, and that is including artists and um, 
yeah, let's say more traditionally female roles. So we have a bit big lack on that side. And where I see the 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 potential is creating games for women that are more than, let's say, Candy Crush or decoration games. And I don't want to dismiss them. I think they have their audience and they are very valid. But um, if you compare it, for example, to movies or the film industry, there's just a bigger variety of genres and a bigger variety of, for example, art house films that you can choose from, which we almost don't have or have just very, in a very limited form, especially when we think about accessibility as well um, in games. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, is there one last uh, question or I think you can... Then I'll, while you ask the question, I'll go see if it's all okay for the next speakers because they're going to join us on Zoom. Mm -hmm. So hi, um, I would like to know a bit how you deal with crunch time because that's also really common in the gaming industry. I don't know how that, um, yeah, maybe you can explain a bit about that. Um, yes, it is a question that I get quite a lot, but I personally don't have too much experience with it. Um, I would say in the companies where I was employed, we almost didn't have it. I mean, yes, maybe we worked late for three days or up to a week before a big release, but late means like, I don't know, until eight o'clock, so it wasn't like uh, weeks or even months that you hear from some bigger companies uh, where you're forced to uh, to crunch, and I think it's um, it's just misplanning if people are forced to crunch. Um, I haven't heard it from other big companies in mainland Europe that much either. And at Fine Games, we also try not to crunch. As I said, maybe there are these odd two to five days before a release where you work a bit more, but then you can. Um, work a bit less the week after, I guess. So, yeah, but I mean, it's a good concern, and probably if you're looking for a job in the games industry, it's a good question to raise with your employer, um, just to get maybe a gauge or also speak to your colleagues um, what they say about it, because of course it's not healthy for no one, not for the company, and even less for the employees. Thank you, thank you, Leah. And on that point, Lely, Leslie asked you will also talk about well-being, and, and mm -hmm. so I think it will be a nice uh, link to this afternoon talk. Great. But uh, thank you so much, Leah, for thank your talk you. and being here today. Um, I think we can. Uh, yeah, you can. Just I just disconnect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you.